I am uh, I'm very, very pleased to have with us Richard Stallman, who really needs no introduction, but I'll give one anyway. Here at Ars Digita, we have a monthly colloquium where prominent people in the computer industry and in academia teach us all about what they've been doing. And Richard Stallman, for the last, I guess, about 20 years, has been the leader of the open source movement or free nope. software. Nope. I have nothing to do with them. But free software. Maybe you better let me do this. Oh, you're going to do it? <laughs> you're repeating the widespread errors we have to struggle to correct. Oh, all right. So <laughs> There must be thousands of people who have joined the open source movement because they think I'm a member of it. So you introduce me, and then we'll... <laughs> <laughs> this is a person that I've never seen before, or if I have, my degrading memory doesn't re retain it. Uh, and he he's here in this university to introduce speakers like me. There you go. <laughs> that, and give all sorts of mistaken information about them, so that they then have to s struggle to correct it in their speeches. But what can you do? All right, he, I'll be out in a minute, and then you will know better. I will know better. Um, you have received a, a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship for this work, uh, which is a wonderful. Actually, achievement. nobody knows. Oh, is that a nobody? Secret? They don't say what they give it to you for. Oh, it's a uh, so they like your grooming. So it's <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> On oh, my long, beautiful hair, so I just oh, and. <laughs> You are the author of the GNU uh, Emacs and yeah. operating system? No. Most of it? <laughs> Emacs is a text editor. I know, and the operating system. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I know it's a text editor. <laughs> <laughs> I can even cut and paste. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. I will, let, uh, I will now pass it over to Richard Stallman. Please join me in welcoming him. Well, I'm here to speak about the free software movement and the development of the GNU operating system or how we developed an operating system that's used by some 20 million people who don't know they're using it. But really it's about a question of how society should work. Most of the time when people pose the question of what rules society should have for the use of software, those people work for software companies and they pose the question in a self-serving way. They address it in a self-serving way. They ask, what rules can we impose on everybody else to make them give us a lot of money? But I had the good fortune in the 1970s to be part of a community of programmers who shared software. And this led me to look at that question from a different direction, to ask what kind of rules make possible a good society for the people who live in it? And so I reached completely different answers. Let me say a little bit about that community, what it was like. Well, this community included programmers at many of the best universities and even people at computer companies sometimes participated. But perhaps the place where the community was deepest was at the lab at MIT where I worked, the Artificial Intelligence Lab. Because there, we had an entire operating system that was made up of the community's shared software. And we would share it with anybody who wanted it. So, uh, our lives were completely within this community. In the, you know, any software that we had, we'd share. Any software that we wrote or anybody in the community wrote, you just took for granted they were going to share it. It was almost unthinkable that they would do anything else. Uh, and so if you walked past another hacker's screen and you saw something interesting, you'd say, hey, what is that? And he'd say, oh, it's the new FUBAR program that we just got from Stanford, and it's in the FUBAR directory. So in that directory, you would find the executable that you could run. You'd also find the source codes. So you could read it and study how they solved those problems. And in running the program, if you ran into bugs or had ideas for new features, you could go to the source code and you could fix the bugs or add new features. You could even cut a piece out to put it into some other program you were writing. 
which we used to call cannibalizing the program, which was intentionally humorous, of course, because doing that did not destroy the old program. Uh, since then, some academics started making a big study about code reusability and how you could encourage this. But we knew that the best way to encourage code reusability was to make the source code available to people who might perhaps want to reuse it. So you could use a program not just by running it, but in all the various ways it might be useful to you. The software we developed was part of human knowledge. We were all on humanity's team, not working against each other, but all making knowledge available to anyone in humanity who wanted to use it. And sometimes a program would pass from one person to another to another being developed by a series of people over a period of 15 years, perhaps. And so the system grew sort of the way a city grows. You know, you'd see here there's some new parts of the system, but next to them there are some old parts, and by their style you can recognize, oh, these must go back to the 1960s. At one point, we needed a cross-assembler to generate code for the PDP-11 that would run on the PDP-10, which was our main computer. The PDP-11 was a, a, a much smaller computer that we wanted to use as an I.O. processor. Well, we could have just written this, but to save time, we looked around. I went over to Harvard, where I was a student, and in their PDP-10 lab, they had a cross-assembler. It, I think, was written by somebody at Digital, but I'm not sure because there was no copyright notice on it. But they did have the source code. So I made a copy and brought it over to MIT. There, however, we could not immediately use it because it was written for Digital's time-sharing system, and we needed it to run on our time-sharing system, the incompatible time-sharing system, or ITS for short, the system that was written by hackers for hackers. So I made those changes and added some additional features to make the assembler easier to use in practice, and then we used it for a, very, for a number of years. Then somebody at the company BBN was looking for a cross-assembler that would run on their PDP-10 time-sharing system, 10X. He heard about this one, so he contacted me. I sent him a copy. He ported it to 10X and added additional features. Then we got together. We merged these two versions into one common version with conditionals for the two systems and all of the features of either version. And then we maintained it together for a number of years, as long as we kept using that, those computers. <clears throat> and so this shows what cooperation is like in using software. But then we got a taste of what life was like for most computer users, people who were not part of a community like ours. That happened when Xerox gave MIT a laser printer. Now, this was actually a very nice gift because it was the first time anybody outside Xerox ever had a laser printer. It was the first generation laser printer. It was actually a high-speed office copier that had been modified with a laser attachment to turn it into a printer. And in some ways, it was very good. It, was, it, it printed a page a second which was incredibly fast, and it had very high resolution. The straight lines came out nice and straight, but it was also unreliable, frequently getting paper jams. And because, as a printer, it was not being attended by any person, it would stay jammed for a very long time, and this made it, in practice, extremely unreliable to use and quite slow. Now, when we saw these problems, we immediately knew a solution because the previous printer, which was uh, much slower and low resolution and tended to make vertical lines come out a bit wavy, was also unreliable, frequently getting paper jams or running out of some supplies. 
And because we couldn't make the printer itself any better, we compensated for those problems by adding features to the software. We were able to do that for the old printer because the old printer was controlled by free software. And in fact, the printer control program ran in a PDP-11, and we used that cross-assembler to build it. So, for instance, we added a feature that every time a print job finished, the PDP-11 would tell the PDP-10, and the PDP-10 would display a message for the user who had printed it, saying, your file foo has been printed. So you would have to wait because the printer was slow, but you didn't have to wait extra simply from not knowing that your printout was actually there waiting for you. And then there was another feature, which I recall adding, that every time the printer got in trouble, the PDP-11 would tell the PDP-10, which would search the print queue and, print a, and display a message for each user currently waiting for output, saying, the printer is in trouble, go fix it. Now, if you got that message, you would realize that only a few people were going to get that message. So you could not count on somebody else to do it. No, you would go to the printer right away. So every time the printer got in trouble, a minute later, two or three people would show up. One of them at least would know how to fix the problem and would teach the others. In effect, we treated the user as part of the system and added end-to-end -end feedback, thus obtaining a reliable operation for the system as a whole, even though the printer component was still unreliable in itself. So the printer would often get stopped, but the users would get it going again right away, so its downtime was very, very little. And as a whole, the system now worked smoothly. So we wanted to use the same approach to solve the problems for the new printer. But there we ran into a stone wall. Because the new printer was controlled by proprietary Xerox spooling software, we did not have the source code, and that meant we were helpless to make any changes to it. We were as good programmers as you could have found anywhere in the world. But our ability was for nothing because we didn't have the source code. We were, in effect, prisoners of our software. And the result was constant frustration. You'd type the command to print a file, and you'd go back to work, knowing that it was going to take a long time. A while later, you'd notice the time. Oh, it's been half an hour. Probably not worth going to the printer yet. Go back to work. A while later, you'd notice the time. Oh, it's been an hour. Maybe it's printed now. So you'd go upstairs to the printer and you'd see it had been jammed the whole time. So you'd fix the jam and go back to work. And a while later you'd notice the time. Oh, it's been half an hour. Maybe it's printed now. So you'd go back to the printer and you'd see it printed 200 pages of other people's stuff, which took three minutes for that fast printer, and then jammed again. And at that point you'd say, I'm going to stand here and fix this damn thing every time it jams, until I get my output. So it wasn't working the way it was supposed to work. And it, was a, it doubled the frustration to realize that we could have fixed this problem, but somebody else was not letting us. Now, Xerox gave us a very fancy gift, very expensive gift. I couldn't say that they owed it to us to write some software for us, too but they should have let us write it. That's what, w what seemed wrong. Then I heard that somebody at Carnegie Mellon had a copy of the software source code. By and by I was visiting there, so I went to his office and I said, hi, I'm from MIT. Could I have a copy of the printer software source code? And he said, no, I promised not to give you a copy. <laughs> I was stunned. I was angry, but I had no idea how to express it. All I could do was turn around and walk out of his office without saying another word to him. But I thought about it afterward. You see, this, this was very bad for us at the AI lab because we never got a copy of that source code. We were never able to fix the problem, and the printer remained frustrating 
for as long as we kept using it. But in a paradoxical way, it was very good for me because it taught me an important lesson, a lesson that's important because most programmers don't learn it. You see, he had promised to refuse to give a copy of this useful source code to us, his colleagues at MIT. He had promised to refuse to cooperate with us if we needed his help. But he didn't just do this to us. Chances are he did it to you too. Promised he would refuse to cooperate with you if you needed his help. And most likely he did it to you too. And I would expect he probably did it to you too. In fact, he probably did it to most of the people in this room, except that there may be a few who weren't born yet back then in 1980. Because he promised to deny his cooperation, to refuse to help just about everybody alive at the time. He had signed a non-disclosure agreement, in effect promising not to cooperate in a crucial way with essential with almost everybody on earth. Now, this was my first direct encounter with a non-disclosure agreement. I heard of them, of course. I was the victim. I and my whole lab were the victims in this case of the non-disclosure agreement. And the lesson it taught me was that non-disclosure agreements have victims. Now, this is a very important lesson because most programmers don't learn it. Why don't they learn it? Because they don't want to. You see, most programmers first encounter a non-disclosure agreement when they're invited to sign one. And there's always a temptation, some sort of goodie that they're going to get if they sign. So they make up excuses not to look at the moral issue, not to recognize what it is they're really doing to other people. They say to themselves, well, he'll never get a copy no matter what, so what difference does it make if I join the conspiracy to deprive him? Or they say, this is the way it's always done. Who am I to object? Or they say, if I don't do this, somebody else will. Various excuses to gag their consciences. But when I was invited to sign a non-disclosure agreement, my conscience was already sensitized to the issue, and it would not be silent. I remembered how angry I was and how frustrated I was when somebody else refused to share with me and my whole lab, and I could not turn around and do the same exact thing to unknown other people. After all, the non-disclosure agreement is a blank check of non-cooperation. It says, I promise I will not cooperate with blank if blank needs my help. And this blank gets filled in later by circumstances, perhaps with a stranger, perhaps with your best friend. So, <laughs> that's great sound recording technique, I must say. <laughs> So, so I said to the person who was offering me some software I could have under non-disclosure, thank you so much for offering me this nice software package, but I cannot in good conscience accept the conditions you have set, so I'm going to do without it. No thank you. And thus I have never knowingly signed a non-disclosure agreement for generally useful technical information such as software. Now I make that, uh, I put on those adjectives because there are other kinds of information that raise different ethical issues. For example, there's personal information. And the ethical issues about confidentiality of personal information are completely different. For instance, if you wanted to talk with me about what was happening between you and your girlfriends and ask me please not to tell anybody else, uh, you know, I could promise you that. 
because that information is not generally useful technical information. At least it probably isn't. <laughs> now, I could imagine that you might disclose to me some marvelous new sex technique, and I might then feel a moral duty to pass this on to the rest of humanity, to other people who might perhaps have a chance to make use of it. But if you just wanted to talk about who got angry at who, why, and things like that, you know, the soap opera stuff, uh, that inf those details won't enable everybody else to live a better life. It's, it's not something that is important to, to teach everybody else. So I could agree to keep that confidential for you. But when it comes to the stuff of science and technology and engineering, the, the mission of our field is to develop this information so that people can make use of it, to contribute it to humanity, to human knowledge. If we withhold the knowledge from humanity, we're betraying the mission of our field. I made the decision that I would not do this. But at about the same time that I was coming to that conclusion, a series of calamities fell on my community, ultimately wiping it out. The last nail in the coffin, I think, was when digital discontinued the PDP-10. The incompatible time-sharing system was written starting in the 1960s. So, of course, it was written in assembler language, assembler language for the PDP-10. So when the PDP-10 was discontinued, effectively all of our work turned into dust and blew away, which was tragic enough, many years of work, turning to nothing like that. But even worse, the only way you could get a, an operating system for a... Mo sorry, start over. The only way you could get a modern computer and start to use it was to get, sign a non-disclosure agreement for a proprietary operating system because all the operating systems for those modern computers were proprietary. So I found myself in a situation where to continue in my field of operating system development would have meant rejecting the moral decision I had just made. I couldn't continue doing my work the way I had been doing it because that depended on being part of the community that was no more. So this put me in a moral dilemma. What was I going to do now in my professional life? Well, the most obvious choice would have been to put aside my principles and accept the way the world had changed, start using proprietary software, signing non-disclosure agreements, and I'm sure MIT would have had me developing proprietary software too because MIT had already done that kind of thing, you know, taking the software developed by its staff and turning it into proprietary software products. Well, I thought about this possibility and realized that this way I could have fun coding and I could make money, too, especially if I left MIT and did it for a company. But at the end, I would have to look back and say, I have spent my career building walls to divide people. And I would have been ashamed of everything I had done. So I looked for another alternative. And I realized, well, it didn't take long for me to find another. And that was I could leave the field of software. Now, many programmers seem to regard this as unthinkable. They say, the people who hire programmers demand this, this, and this. If I don't do those things, I'll starve. That's literally what they say. But even in the U.S., even today, there are millions of people who make a living not in the computer field. <laughs> so, obviously, those people are exaggerating somewhat. Now, I had no other noteworthy skills, but I'm sure I could have been a waiter. <laughs> Not in a fancy restaurant, I suppose, but I could have been a waiter somewhere. 
Now, one thing about being a waiter is you're not doing anything unethical. So it is an ethical way to survive. And from the, for the moral question, that's important because you can justify doing some unethical things if it's the only way to survive. But once you've found an ethical way to survive, that justification is gone. And the other thing about being a waiter is you're not going to starve. <laughs> However, I realized that being a waiter for me would be no fun at all. And also, it would be wasting my skills as an operating system developer. It would avoid misusing my skills, but it would still be wasting them. So I decided to look for some other possibility, something that would be not just ethically adequate, but better. What could an operating system developer do that would make the world a better place, that would get out of this dilemma? I realized that an operating system developer was exactly what was needed. The dilemma existed for me and for every computer user because all the operating systems were proprietary. So if we were to develop another operating system and make it free, give everyone the freedom to use it and share it. We could give everybody, including me, another way out of the dilemma. I realized that this was something in my field that was actually worth trying to do. All the other things I could have done were not worth even trying to do because they would have just been building the walls higher. But this would have been making doors, knocking down the walls. So I decided to try my damnedest to develop a free software operating system. Well, that led me to the question of design decisions. But that was actually an easy question. You see, I had just seen one whole operating system that I loved turn into dust and blow away because it was designed for one specific computer architecture that was discontinued. I didn't want to develop another system and have it suffer the same fate. So it was clear we had to make a portable operating system. Well, at the time, I knew of just one portable operating system that was successful, and that was Unix. And Unix also had some advanced ideas by the standards of the day, features such as pipes, redirection of I.O., uh, shell programming, the simple fork and exec system calls that people really used. So I decided to follow the design of Unix. That would give me a pretty good chance of making a system that would be usable and that wouldn't become quickly obsolete. Furthermore, I realized that it was important to make the system upward compatible with Unix. The reason is that I knew full well that users don't like incompatible changes. I could have taken the best ideas from the operating systems I had worked on or used or read about and added my own pet ideas to make my dream operating system. And I realized that if I got the system to work and showed it to the users, they would have said, well, this is very nice, but it's incompatible. We've already written our programs to run on Unix, and it would be too big a change to make them run on your system, so we're not going to use it. Thank you very much. And then it would have been a failure as a way of giving people freedom. Now, if I had just wanted to make an excuse for myself, it would have been sufficient. I could have said, well, I offered them freedom. They didn't take it. Now it's not my fault. It's their fault. But I didn't want to just make an excuse. I wanted to actually give people the benefits of liberty. And to do that, I realized I'd have to make a system that people would choose to use. So I decided to make the system upward compatible with Unix. Unix consisted and still consists of many different components that work together through more or less documented interfaces. So to be compatible with Unix, you have to compatibly replace each component one by one, which means all the basic design decisions are made by those interfaces. 
the remaining design decisions within any one component didn't have to be made at the beginning. They could wait for whoever was going to write that component to make. So, in effect, all the design decisions, the basic design decisions of the project were already made, except one, which was what set of target machines would we aim for. Unix was designed to run on 16-bit computers, which were the most common kinds of computers at that time. But I realized it would take us a number of years to get a whole system developed. And by that time, 32-bit computers were going to become cheap enough for everybody to use them. And supporting 16-bit computers was a lot of extra work because their limited address space forces you to design every program to fit in that small address space. So I decided not to support 16-bit machines, only the 32-bit machines. And it turns out that, that was a good decision. By the time we had a complete GNU system, indeed, people were using 32-bit computers. And it saved us a lot of extra trouble. So the design decisions were made. All we needed was a name. We hackers always look for funny, clever, naughty names for programs. Because thinking of the users being amused by the name is half the fun of writing the program. And there was a hacker tradition that when you're writing a program that's similar to some existing program, you can give the new program a name which is a recursive acronym that says that this program is not the other one. So, for instance, there, in the 60s and 70s, there were many Tico text editors, and most of them were called this Tico or that Tico or whatchamacallit Tico. But one clever hacker called his version Tint, for Tint is not Tico, <laughs> the first recursive acronym. In 1975, I developed the first Emacs extensible text editor. And after that, there were many imitations of Emacs, and many of them were called this Emacs or that Emacs or who's he, what's this Emacs. But one was called fine for fine is not Emacs. And then there was sign for sign is not Emacs. And mince for mince is not complete Emacs. And Ina for Ina is not Emacs. And then Ina was almost completely rewritten. And the new version was called Zwei for Zwei was Aina initially. <laughs> so you can have lots of fun with recursive acronyms. I decided to look for a recursive acronym for something is not Unix. But it took only a minute or so for me to discover that all, of those, all 26 of those possibilities are not words. So none of them was especially funny. Uh, so I tried another way of doing it. I made a contraction, and I discovered that the word GNU, which is one of the most humor-laden words in the English language, could work if it could stand for GNU's not Unix. Well, with such a funny word to use, my search was obviously ended. I should point out, of course, that the reason why this word is used for so many jokes is that the dictionary says it's pronounced GNU. And so the practice of asking what's GNU didn't start with the GNU project. There's even a funny song inspired by and about the word GNU. And I should also point out that this word is a loan word from an African language, and the correct pronunciation has a click sound in it. When the European colonists got there, they didn't bother learning to pronounce this click sound. Instead, they left it out. And they wrote a G in the word simply to mean there's a sound here that we are not trying to pronounce. And then somebody else who was writing a dictionary said, well, we Europeans pronounce it this way and spell it this way, so these are correct and everything else is wrong. I've been invited to visit South Africa next June, so I hope I will finally have a chance to learn to pronounce the word correctly. That is, when it's the name of an animal. But when it's the name of our system, the correct pronunciation is GNU. So please pronounce a hard G. If you talk about the new operating system, 
you're going to get people very confused. You see, we've been working on it for 17 years now, so it's not new anymore. But it still is and always will be GNU, no matter how many people call it Linux by mistake. <clears throat> so, we had a name, we could start work. I posted an announcement on the net asking for people to help, and in January 1984, I quit my job at MIT to start writing GNU. I had to quit my job because if I, you know, universities like MIT, including MIT, often take the programs written by their staff and turn them into proprietary software products. I didn't want that to happen, and I didn't want to have to beg and plead with the MIT administration to be able to release the software in the way I had in mind. So I took them out of the equation by quitting. But the pro pro but Professor Winston, who was the head of the AI lab, was nice enough to let me keep using the facilities. I went into his office and he said, you still want to quit? And I said, yes. He said, you want to keep your key? <laughs> okay. I hadn't been expecting that. It took me by surprise, but I said yes, and I started using a Unix machine at the AI lab to develop pieces of GNU. Now, at the time, I thought that we would replace all of these components and then when we had a whole system we'd say come and get it and then people would start using our work. That's not how it happened. In September 1984 I started working on GNU Emacs which was my second implementation of the extensible text editor. By early 1985 it was working well enough that I could use it for all my editing which was a big relief. You see, I had absolutely no intention of learning to use VI. So, <laughs> until that time, I did all my editing on other computers and had to transfer the files through the network in order to test them. So that meant I could do my editing on the Unix machine. Oh, and by the way, this illustrates another fact. I was never a Unix wizard. And in fact, I never used Unix until... I started the GNU project. Uh, fortunately, once I started using it and got to see its flaws close up, they weren't too bad. I concluded it was still a good decision to imitate the design of Unix. Anyway, so when Emacs was good enough for me to use, it was good enough for a bunch of other people also, people started asking me for copies. And that meant I had to work out the details of how to distribute it. Of course, I put a copy in the anonymous FTP directory, and that was good for people who were on the net. But in 1985, even most American programmers were not on the net. So I was getting emails from the others asking me for how they could get copies. And I had to decide what to respond. Now, I could have said to them, legitimately, I want to spend my time writing more GNU software, not writing tapes. So find a friend who's on the net and who's willing to download it for you, and you'll get it that way. I'm sure that they would have found a suitable friend after a while, and they would have got copies if they really wanted them. But I had no job, and in fact, I've never had a job since then. So I was looking for some way I could make money through my work on free software. Therefore, I posted an announcement, send me $150 and I'll mail you a tape of Emacs. And the orders began dribbling in. By the middle of the year, they were trickling in. I was getting some 8 to 10 orders a month. And that was, if necessary, enough for me to live on because I've always lived cheaply. I live like a student, basically. And I do this by choice. You see, most Americans, if they start making this much, they look for a way they can spend this much. <laughs> so 
they start buying houses and cars and boats and airplanes and paintings and rare stamps and adventure vacations and children and <laughs> all these expensive luxuries and then they get hooked on them and they say I can't give them up or I can't stop paying for them and therefore I must do whatever the people with the money tell me to do. The more of these expensive habits you've got, the less choice you have in your life. But if you resist these expensive habits, you just don't get hooked on them in the first place, then it's easy for you to say no. And you can choose to do what you want to do with your life instead of letting money pull your strings. So, <clears throat> so this was one of the first free software businesses, at least one of the first associated with the modern free software community. Uh, yet there are people who keep saying that I'm anti-commercial. You know, uh, it's unaccountable what some people will say. However, some people used to ask me, what do you mean it's free software if it costs $150? And there, the problem is that there's a confusion in the English language. The word free has multiple legitimate meanings. One of these meanings refers to price, and another refers to freedom. When I speak of free software, I'm referring to freedom, not price. So think of free speech, not free beer. That will give you the right kind of meaning of the word freedom. Some of those people who were using Emacs got their copies from me through the net and didn't pay me anything. Others got their copies from me on a tape, and most of them paid me. A few friends I'd make tapes for and not charge them, of course. And then there are others who got their copies not from me directly, but from someone else. Maybe they paid to someone else, but they didn't pay me. So Emacs was gratis for some users and not for others. Some had paid. But all of these users had certain important freedoms. And that's what I'm referring to when I say that Emacs is free software. The fact that the users have certain freedom. And that is what we're working for. Uh, all else being equal, I think it's fine if programmers are paid more money you know, within reason. Uh, as long as they don't end up impoverishing the rest of the world, I think it's good if programmers get paid well. I, I, d I haven't sworn a vow of poverty. I spend little so that I can have money accumulating and never have to worry about a budget. You see, it's not that I intend to be poor. But having freedom and a good community takes precedence over this. That's what's really important, and that's what free software is about. But it's, it's not really meaningful to say something very general, you know, to say, oh, I believe in freedom. Well, there are lots of different freedoms that people could perhaps have, and they conflict with each other. So to get down to the nitty-gritty, you have to say, which are the freedoms you support? So let me now do that and give the actual definition of free software. A program is free software for you, a particular user, if you have the following freedoms. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program for any purpose. Freedom one is the freedom to help yourself by changing the program to suit your needs. Freedom two is the freedom to help your neighbor by distributing copies of the program to other people. And freedom three is the freedom to help build your community by publishing improved versions so that other people can get the benefit of your work. If you have all these freedoms, the program is free software for you. Freedom zero doesn't require much explanation. Most programs give you freedom zero. There are exceptions, but those are particularly restrictive programs. Also, legally, if you have freedoms one, two, and three, 
freedom zero follows as a consequence. And therefore, the freedoms that distinguish free software from typical software are freedoms one, two, and three. So I'll say more about those. Freedom one is the freedom to help yourself by changing the program to suit your needs. This could mean fixing bugs, adding new features, porting it to another computer system, translating all the messages to Hungarian. Whatever changes you want to make, you should be able to make. Up to you. Nobody else telling you what kinds of changes are good or bad. Now, who can make use of this freedom? Well, obviously, any trained programmer can make use of this freedom. Also, any business that uses software can make use of this freedom. Maybe the business is a clothing business and they don't have any programmers, but if they want a change made, they can go find a programming company and say, how much will you charge for this change and when will it be done? And they can even go to a few companies and ask them the same questions and then make their choice. <clears throat> so for businesses that appreciate support, free software provides them a free market for the support they want, if it's worth paying for, of course. I should explain that freedom number one has a precondition, a prerequisite. The source code must be available to you in order for you to effectively exercise this freedom. The reason is that understanding, let alone changing, a binary is very difficult. Uh, even the most trivial changes, such as using four digits instead of two digits for the year, can be excruciating if you don't have the source code, as indeed some organizations found out a couple of years ago. So access to the source code is a necessary condition for free software. <clears throat> so uh, who else can take advantage of this freedom? Well, anybody who values privacy and security on the computer can take advantage of this freedom because with free software, you can, be ch you can check what the program really does. And if you don't like it, you can change it. And other people can be checking what the program really does. Obviously, except in very high priority cases, you're not going to carefully check every program you use. But sometimes, some people have reasons to check one part or another. And this means that accidental bugs, which we all can make, are more likely to be found. And when they're fixed, you can install the change right away if you care. Also, it means that deliberately inserted Trojan horses and backdoors and snooping features are less likely to be put in because the people know that they would be caught or very likely be caught. With proprietary software, they know that it's almost impossible for you to find out what the program really does. And so there are widely used software packages that snoop on the user and report to centralized places. <clears throat> and finally, any intelligent person can learn a little programming. And most people are not going to learn to be skilled professional programmers. There are other things in life to do. But anybody can learn a little, which is enough to do an easy job. Now, of the things you might want to do, some of them are going to be hard, some of them are going to be easy. If you only learn a little, you can't do a hard job, but you can do an easy one, and that's enough to be useful, even though not perfectly useful. And you can always look for a friend to ask, you know, a, friend, a programmer who owes you a favor, who will you know, and say, would you please make this change for me? So you can get a change made even if you don't know how to program. So if you don't have freedom number one, that causes practical material harm to society. It means you can't change the program to suit your needs. You're stuck with it. 
You're a prisoner of your software. I explained what this was like regarding the Xerox laser printer. But it also causes a kind of psychosocial harm, which affects people's morale, their enthusiasm for their work. If you're eager to get your work done and you go to work each day wanting to make progress, and every day it's frustrating because somebody else is deliberately making it hard for you, well, people have a tendency to protect themselves from frustration by deciding not to care anymore. And people end up with an attitude like this. Oh, well, I showed up for work today, and I brought my book. So if I can't get work done, I'll just get paid to read my book. It's all the same to me. But when people have that attitude, not only they, but society as a whole, are harmed. That is freedom number one, the freedom to help yourself by changing the program to suit your needs. Freedom number two is the freedom to help your neighbor by distributing copies of the program to other people. For beings that can think and learn, sharing useful knowledge is a fundamental act of friendship. When these beings use computers, this act takes the form of sharing software. Now, if you can't share, if a program has an owner who establishes, and it doesn't matter what means are used, if a program has an owner that establishes a situation where every user must pay to use the program, this creates a financial disincentive discouraging the use of the program, and that causes waste, which is practical material harm to society. You see, some of the users will say, some of the possible users will say, all right, I'll pay, and they'll use the program. And others will say, it's too much, never mind, I'll do without. And every time somebody says, never mind, I'll do without, the program is going to waste. But the work it takes to develop the program to any <coughs> given level of power and quality is the same regardless of the number of users. It may even be harder if there are fewer users to help you. So the same work is done, but only part of the potential benefit is realized. The rest is deliberately inflicted waste. But because it's inflicted by keeping people helpless and divided, it causes psychosocial harm as well, which attacks the spirit of goodwill, the willingness, the, the, the feeling, the, the, the spirit of helping your neighbor, which is the most important resource of society. Without this resource, instead of a society, you have a dog-eat-dog -dog jungle where everybody always says, what's in it for me? And life is basically miserable. This resource is so important that the world's major religions explicitly try to encourage this way of looking at the world. And teachers in schools around the world try to inculcate this spirit when kids bring candy to school, the teacher says, you can't eat it all yourself. You have to share with the other kids, trying to teach the habit of thinking of sharing with other people. But nowadays, these teachers are being ordered to do the exact opposite, to tell the kids, oh, you brought software to school. Well, don't share it. Sharing is wrong. Sharing means you're a pirate. What does it mean when major social institutions start telling people that sharing is wrong and that they should, should not be in the habit of sharing with other people? What does that do to our society and its future? What does it mean when they start saying that if you help your neighbor, you're a pirate? They're saying that sharing with your neighbor is the moral equivalent of attacking a ship. 
do you believe that? I don't believe that. I reject that word and I won't use it. And what does it mean when these owners of software get governments on their side and start threatening people with years in prison if they help their neighbors? How much fear is it going to take to convince people to stop sharing with their neighbors? Do you want to live in a society pervaded by that level of fear? I certainly don't. If we want to reject this fear, we have to reject the laws, deny moral legitimacy to the laws that impose this fear. And so, I believe this is the most important reason of all the reasons why software should be free. To pollute this psychosocial resource is so dangerous for society that we must reject any kind of social institutions that try to do so. In fact, only police state type laws can do so. The United States was not the first country to make a high priority of stopping people from this underground, unauthorized copying of interesting information. The Soviet Union also made a priority of this, stamping out what was known as Samizdat, the unauthorized copying and redistribution of information. And they developed various methods to achieve this, including harsh uh, including guards watching each piece of copying equipment, checking what was being copied, including harsh punishments for anyone caught doing unauthorized copying, including, as a means of catching them, asking everyone to inform on everyone else, including, as a further means of catching people, collective responsibility, you, you're going to watch that group. If I catch anybody in that group doing unauthorized copying, you're responsible. You're going to prison. And including propaganda starting in childhood to say that only a vicious enemy of the people would ever do this unauthorized copying. The United States is using all of these methods, although the details are different. In the Soviet Union, they had human beings watching all copying equipment. In the U.S., humans to watch your computer's usage would be too expensive, so they use robot guards, software that goes into your computer and is required to be there, and bypassing it is a crime. Second, harsh punishments. Well, ten years ago, it wasn't a crime to make copies of something and hand them out to your friends just to be nice. It had never been a crime in the U.S. Then they made it a felony. So you could be put in prison for years for helping your neighbors. Third, informers. Well, I saw ads in the Boston subway a year ago asking people to rat on their co-workers to the information police otherwise known as the Software Publishers Association. And fourth, collective responsibility. In the U.S., the Internet service providers have been conscripted into enforcing these laws on their customers. They've been made legally responsible for everything their customers post unless they have a uniform policy without exceptions of taking down everything within two weeks after a complaint. And the, the owner of the site is allowed to object saying, I think they have misidentified this material. It's not really their copyrighted material. But otherwise, you don't even get your day in court your site just gets unplugged unceremoniously. And as a result, copying is even using as a means to cover up information 
about wrongdoing by companies, you know, dangerous products that they knew about. Uh, I believe it was internal Ford documents that were posted on a website that was suppressed saying it was a copyright violation. And that site was simply unplugged. And finally, propaganda starting in childhood. That's what the word pirate is about. And other propaganda words like protection. You know, they, they like to call these restrictions quote, protection, unquote, as if, as if a program was somehow going to be damaged or destroyed because more people were running it. That's what that word is meant to sneak into your thoughts without conscious examination. So be on the lookout for these measures these Soviet-style measures. The United States is trying to pressure all the other countries in the world to adopting these measures. When people discuss human rights in China, the U.S. government says, well, we'll bring it up, but we have very little influence with China on these matters. Well, the reason is the U.S. has considerable influence with China, but dedicates it, first of all, to copyright enforcement. And there's very little left over for anything like human rights. Well, that is freedom number two, the freedom to help your neighbor by distributing copies of a program. Freedom three is the freedom to help build your community by publishing an improved version so other people can get the benefit of your additions to the program. People used to say to me, if the software is free, then nobody will get paid to work on it, so nobody will work on it. Obviously, they were confusing those two meanings of free. They thought it meant free as in zero price, which is not, which is not accurate. But in any case, that was their theory. Today, we can compare that theory with observed fact, and we see that both steps are false. First, there are now hundreds, at least, of people getting paid to develop free software, and there are tens of thousands working on free software, mostly part-time, as unpaid volunteers. One development site has over 20,000 registered volunteers. So that theory is extremely wrong. When I first released GNU Emacs, and people started using it, after a while, I got a message saying, I found a bug, here's a fix. And I got another message saying, here's a new file that adds another feature. And another bug fix, and another new feature, and another, and another, and another, until they were pouring in on me so fast that simply making use of all the help I was getting was a big job. It was hard to keep up. Microsoft doesn't have this problem. <laughs> And this phenomenon has since been noted. The phenomenon that w when a free program catches on, you often get a community of people helping to develop it. And free software is starting to get a reputation for being powerful and reliable, which is totally the opposite of what people just naively assumed 10 years ago. There are even scientific tests showing that a set of free utilities, the GNU utilities, was more, that is certain specific programs from the GNU project that happened to be utilities, were more reliable than the various other alternatives that were measured. They would feed them random sequences of input and see how often they would crash or hang. That's the measure of unreliability. And this was repeated a few years later and once again found that the GNU programs were the most reliable of all the sets tested. In fact, there is even a group of people that have focused on this particular practical benefit as the reason why people should have these freedoms. 
That group calls itself the Open Source Movement. It was founded in 1998. And whereas we in the free software movement cite both reasons of principle and practical benefits, you've heard me doing so here, in the open source movement, they studiously avoid raising any issues of principle. They cite only practical convenience, practical benefits for the conduct that they recommend. And that is the fundamental difference between the open source movement, which I do not support, and the free software movement, which I founded what values we cite. So the difference is at the fundamental level. It's interesting, therefore, that we engage in conduct that is pretty similar. So we can actually work together on practical projects, and we do. You know, if somebody wants to help develop a GNU program, we don't say to him, well, what's your, what are your political beliefs? No, if, you, if a person wants to help and follow our procedures, the helper is welcome. But we do not want to be misidentified as agreeing with the other group. Because philosophically, we want to spread our philosophy, not theirs. We want to encourage people to think about these values that are not narrowly practical. Values of freedom and community and cooperation and, and having a society where not pervaded by fear. <clears throat> So when you talk about the work of the GNU project, please don't describe it as open source. Please describe us as free software developers. Now as for yourself, your views are up to you. You can support one or the other of these movements or neither. You could even say you somewhat agree with both or you know, there are various possibilities for what opinions you can have. But I would like to ask you, ask for your support for the free software movement. And if you agree with us, please show other people your support by waving our banner, wearing our badge. Our banner, our badge is the phrase free software. By using the term free software, you can show people that you care about those other values as well and you can call people's attention to them, so it has a practical effect. Of course, if you support the open source movement totally, you're just as entitled to express those views. I hope you'll still work with us on practical projects, and we're still willing to work with you. <clears throat> so, if you don't have freedom number three to make, to publish improved versions, that causes practical material harm to society because this phenomenon of community development can't happen and the pro program doesn't become powerful and reliable this way. It also causes psychosocial harm which affects the spirit of scientific cooperation, a spirit which was once so strong that scientists would cooperate even when their countries were at war but is now in grave danger. I read that U.S. Marines landing on an island in the Pacific during World War II found a building with a note on it, a note addressed to them. The note said, this is a marine biology lab. We have put our specimens and records in order so that American scientists can pick up our work where we left off. The note was written by Japanese scientists. They were working to advance human knowledge. They didn't want their work to be lost. They didn't care which nationalities scientists would continue it as long as it wouldn't get lost. But today, it seems that every little gang of scientists and engineers is at war with every other little gang a many ways civil war within our country even. And why we allow this practice to continue, I do not understand. So those are the three 
freedoms that distinguish free software from typical software and the six reasons why they're important. Three practical reasons and three reasons about the kind of society we live in. <clears throat> if you have all of these freedoms, then the program is free software for you, a particular user. The reason I define it in this way with respect to a particular arbitrarily chosen user is because sometimes the same code can be free software for some people and non-free for others. Now that might seem strange, so let me illustrate it with an example. The biggest example I know of, of this problem, is the X window system, which was developed at MIT and released under a license that gave people these freedoms. So if you got a copy from that development group, you had all these freedoms, and the program was free software for you. But among those who got copies from MIT were various computer manufacturers that used Unix systems. They ported X over to their platforms, made, you know, making the comparatively minor changes necessary to get it to run. Then they compiled it, and they took just the binaries and put them into their Unix systems and distributed them under the same non-disclosure agreements as all the rest of Unix. And then hundreds of thousands, eventually probably millions of users, got copies from them along with their Unix systems and their computers. And they had none of these freedoms. The result was a paradoxical situation. If you ask the question, is the X window system free software or not, the answer depended on where you made the measurement. If you made it coming out of the developers group, you'd say, yeah, hmm, I observe all the necessary freedoms, it's free software. If you made it among the users, you'd say, hmm, I typically observe the users don't have these freedoms, it's not free software. In fact, for most users, it was not free software. And for some of the machines on which it could run, the free version didn't support them. So for those machines, it was impossible to get access free software, even if you knew that it had been free software. Because the free version just wouldn't run on some machines. Now, the developers of X did not consider this a problem because they weren't seeking to give people freedom. They were looking for a big professional success, and they got one. It was used by millions of people. It was a de facto standard. But in the GNU project, our goal was to spread freedom throughout society, freedom and cooperation and community. So if those same things had happened to us, for us, it would have been a failure. I had already seen this happening before I started the GNU project, not with X, because X didn't exist then, but with other programs. And so I looked for a way to prevent it from happening to GNU software. The method I developed is called copyleft. You can think of copyright as taking, sorry, copyleft as taking copyright and flipping it over. Uh, Here's how the method works. First, we say this program is copyrighted with the usual copyright notice. And legally, that means, by default, that modifying it or copying it is prohibited. But then we say, you're authorized to copy and distribute this. You're authorized to modify this. You're authorized to distribute even modified and extended versions. But there is a condition. And, of course, that condition is the reason why we go to all this trouble. The condition says, anytime you distribute a program that is wholly or partly, is based in whole or in part on, on any of this, you must distribute it as a whole under these same rules, no more and no less, meaning you can't add any other restrictions when you pass it on. So whoever gets the program from you gets the same freedom from you that you got from me. Wherever the program goes, the freedom goes with it. They become legally inseparable. All the users who have the software have freedom with it. In effect, these freedoms I've been talking about become inalienable rights for the users of these programs. 
Now, I think that they should be inalienable rights for all users of published software, but I can't bring that about. But by using the copyleft technique, I can bring it about, modulo the ability of the legal system to enforce it, for the software that I write. And in the GNU project, using copyleft is our normal approach. We have a few copyleft licenses that you can use. Our most usual one is the GNU General Public License, which is used for more than half of all free software projects. And it's designed so that you can simply drop it into your program and put suitable notices on the source files, and then your program is copylefted. Uh, we also have a few alternative copyleft licenses that permit additional things, which we use in special, unusual cases, such as for the GNU C library. We also have a form of copyleft used, designed for documentation, for manuals, and more generally for any kind of textbooks or written materials that ought to be free in this way. Now, the reason this is important is that free software needs free documentation. Why is that? Well, documentation is an essential part of any software package. If the package doesn't come with a complete explanation of what you need to know as a user, it's missing something. But if the package is meant to be free software, that means not only the code, but the manuals have to be free. After all, when you pass along the program itself, you ought to pass along copies of the manual. And when you change the program, the old manual may not be right anymore. If you're conscientious, you better change the manual to go with your version of the program. So if the manual doesn't permit you to do that, it doesn't really do the job. We need a manual that will permit you to do the conscientious thing when you change the program. And also, of course, many, in many cases, the manual could simply use improvements. And you may want to do the work to improve it. So the same freedoms that are needed for the software are needed for the manuals as well. The GNU Free Documentation License is designed with certain special features to facilitate commercial publishers publishing copylefted free commercial manuals, of course, then selling copies in bookstores in the usual way. By the way, we have been selling free manuals both through bookstores and directly for some 14 years now. And it is a successful thing to do. Uh, so there is copylefted free software, and there is also non-copylefted free software. For example, the X window system is non-copylefted free software. Both of them are free, and that both of them are available in free versions that respect your freedom and your community. Copylefted software goes further by actively defending your freedom against anyone who might try to constrict it and destroy it. With the non-copylefted free software, the developers do not actively defend your freedom, but they do respect your freedom themselves. They are not doing anything that attacks your freedom. So they're not doing anything wrong, and they're simply not doing as much right. Uh, the software they develop is free and can be part of a free operating system. And there are some important pieces of non-copylefted free software which we decided to include in the GNU system. One of them is the X window system. When I started the GNU project, at that time, Unix did not have a window system. But I had written a couple of window systems at MIT, and I was determined that eventually GNU should be easy to use like the Macintosh. So clearly, clearly we had to have a window system. However, as the 1980s went along, 
I saw the X window system. I saw that it was becoming popular. It was, it did the job, or at least it did its job reasonably well. And so I decided at a certain point, we are not going to write a window system for GNU. We're going to use X. After all, the job of writing an entire Unix-like operating system was so big, people used to say we could never get it done. We had to try to save work. And one way to save work is use pieces other people have written whenever possible. And I was constantly looking for pieces that other people had written that we could put into the GNU system to do part of the job. <clears throat> During the 1980s, we were filling in these many pieces that we had to have. In some cases, we found some existing piece of software like X, like Tech, like uh, the Berkeley Floating Point Library and Berkeley Network Utilities, various programs written in various places that we could put into here and part of the job was taken care of. But that only happened by chance. Sometimes somebody else did a program that would do the job and sometimes not because the other people had no systematic reason to be trying to do all these jobs. It was pure chance if they did. So the rest of the time, we had to develop the program or recruit somebody to develop it. That was our main activity. In, 19, in October 1985, we founded the Free Software Foundation, which is a tax-exempt charity to raise funds to promote free software and in particular to develop GNU software. So during the 1980s, some of these pieces of the system were developed by paid staff working for the Free Software Foundation. For instance, the GNU C library and the GNU shell bash, the born again shell, so named in honor of the born shell, which was the Unix shell were developed by staff of the FSF as well as some other programs. But most of the work was done by volunteers. Now, some of these are full-time volunteers. I'm a full-time volunteer. I'm a volunteer because I'm not paid by the FSF. And I work full-time on the GNU project and related things. Now, when the FSF first had enough money to hire somebody, I had to make the decision, should that somebody be me or should we hire someone else? As the president, it was my responsibility to spend the foundation's money in an effective manner. And I realized that hiring Stallman would be like throwing the money away because we could get him to work for nothing. <laughs> so I decided to hire someone else and that that is a sort of rule that we fo have followed all the time until this day. Also, the FSF never pays for my travel expenses except, except once in a while for a taxi to go specifically to a venue within one town. Uh, this is because I could hardly say I'm not getting, you know, if the FSF were paying lots and lots of money for me to travel around the world, it wouldn't really be fair to claim that it's not paying me. So I have to raise those funds elsewhere. Now one of the reasons I do this is so that I can ask other people to volunteer and point to myself as an example to follow. I'd like to ask you to volunteer to contribute to the GNU project and to the free software community in whatever way you can. It's very important for our progress that you join in building the community's operating system. Of course, I'm not the only full-time volunteer. By now, there are probably a few hundred because there are now many companies that will hire people to specifically to develop free software. There are also people working at universities on various projects which are going to be free software. So. It's getting to the point where if you want to get a job developing free software and not uglify your life with non-free software, well, it's no longer as, it's not as easy as falling off a log, but it's no longer an absurd idea. It's no longer a pipe dream. <clears throat>
You can do it. Many people have done this. Some by working for companies, some by starting their own consulting businesses. Uh, once the foundation was started, it took over from me the service of mailing out copies of Emacs on tape. Of course, this ex gradually this, we added other programs to the tapes and then switched to selling CD-ROMs instead. And the FSF has always received most of its income by selling copies of things that everybody is free to copy. Now this is interesting because regularly people tell me that this is impossible because it violates the laws of economics. And yet we keep doing it. It's been a steady source of income for some 14 years or so. I just love disproving the laws of economics. <clears throat> anyway, of course, most volunteers do not work full-time. Most of them are working part-time and are not being paid for it by anyone, but they still contribute a very large amount as an aggregate that way. During the 1980s, we were filling in the various pieces of the system that we needed to have a, a whole system. Eventually, enough of them were filled in that it seemed useful to make a list of what was missing. This became the GNU task list. Initially, a list of pieces of Unix that were missing. Now, those jobs have been done. Now, it's mainly a list of application programs we'd like to add to the system. But there are still plenty of jobs to be done if you'd like to contribute. By the early 1990s, the job was almost done. We had almost the whole system. The main missing piece was the kernel. Now, always trying to find a shortcut, I found a microkernel called Mach that was being developed at Carnegie Mellon University and figured that by using it as the bottom half of our kernel, we could save trouble and we could avoid the hardest part of the debugging, I thought, the part of debugging a program that runs on the bare machine where you have no debugging environment and, uh, and your system crashes whenever there's a problem. And whenever there's a problem, your system is down. Uh, so <clears throat> I thought this would save trouble. However, it turned out, well, it didn't turn out that way. It turned out that the debugging environment that we had on Mach was much worse than we expected. It wasn't entirely reliable. And debugging the multi-threaded servers that communicated by message passing and ran in parallel, which were the top level of our kernel, the GNU herd, as we call it, that turned out to be very, very difficult. They have, you know, they can get into timing errors that were not reproducible. So. It took many, many years to get the GNU herd working. We started it in 1990. Our first test release was in 1996. Fortunately, the community did not have to wait for the GNU herd before they could have a complete free version of the GNU system. Because in 1991, <coughs> Linus Torvalds started writing a kernel on his own, which he eventually released as free software under the name Linux. By 1992, it had the features people needed, and people were putting it together with the GNU system to make a complete free operating system. Now, we did not know about Linux initially because Linus never contacted us about it. But he did announce it on the net, and other people found out about it. And so they were the ones who looked around to find the other programs that you could put together with the kernel to have a complete system. They looked around, and lo and behold, they found everything they needed. What good fortune, they said. It's all here. But there was no coincidence about this. What they had found was a collection of programs which were going to be the GNU system once we had a kernel. So in fact, they were fitting Linux into the kernel-shaped gap in the GNU system. 
But they didn't realize that. They thought that they were building a system on top of Linux. So they called the system a Linux system, which was not the right thing to do because it was basically the GNU system, or it was the combination of GNU and Linux. So an, a, a proper name following the usual conventions of giving credit would be to call the system GNU slash Linux, or GNU plus Linux if you like that punctuation better. It's the combination of the two. And I would like to ask you to give us a share of the credit by calling the system GNU slash Linux. When people call the whole system Linux, in effect, they are giving us none of the credit. And what usually happens is that people get people surmise from the name a mistaken picture of the history as well. They assume that it must have been started by Linus Torvalds in 1991 because otherwise it wouldn't be right to call it by that name. Now, the development of Linux was an important contribution to our community because it filled the last gap in the system. It made it possible to have not just various free programs you could run on top of a non-free system, but to actually have a free system and install it on a bare computer and use all free software. So, in fact, this was the step that carried us over the finish line. But the confusion of calling the whole system by the name Linux was a great setback to the free software movement because it broke the connection between the GNU system and the GNU philosophy. Until that time, people who used GNU software knew it was GNU software. And so they were led from that software to look at our philosophy. Now, when they looked at it, they wouldn't <coughs> automatically agree. They'd make up their own minds. But at least they would see that this philosophy had been the motivation for some software that they liked. So they would take it seriously, and it, they might agree. And if they did agree with the philosophy that is the same thing I've been telling you today, then they would have a motivation to try to contribute to spreading, to increasing free software, developing more free software, and contributing it to the GNU project. So <clears throat> the result was that the software spread our philosophy, and the philosophy gave people a motivation to extend the software. They helped each other. But when people started calling the GNU system by the name Linux, this link from the software to the philosophy was cut and instead, the software started leading people <coughs> to the apolitical philosophy associated with the name Linux, which is the apolitical philosophy of Linus Torvalds. Uh, it's the philosophy that later became that of the open source movement, a philosophy that doesn't look at values of freedom and cooperation and goodwill and living an upright ethical life, but only cites practical benefits from being able to work together on improving the software that the community is using. And ever since then, we've had to struggle to bring our philosophy to the attention of the people who are using the GNU system. I've even heard people say in response to this philosophy that it was a mistake because it would endanger, quote, the popularity of Linux, unquote. So here were people who were saying that the GNU philosophy didn't make sense because it would undermine the success of the GNU system. That's a confusion of means with ends. The GNU system, after all, exists for a reason. It exists to give people freedom and encourage cooperation in a community. But we're being invited by the people who like that system to forget about that goal so that the system can be more of a success. The person who said this to me didn't realize what a reversal it was because he didn't know it was the GNU system. He thought it was Linux. And the only goal he had ever heard stated for Linux was the goal of success the goal of having lots of users. 
they even describe this goal as world domination. Now, of course, they're making a joke. They really don't want to force anybody to do things. But still, it's quite a reversal to speak of spreading freedom and spreading liberty and cooperation and, and goodwill throughout the world to speaking of domination. And so people sometimes ask me, or if they suggest to me, they give me advice that almost is very wise advice. They say, why make such a fuss about credit? It would be better, we would, would be wiser to let the matter drop, to smile to yourself when you see people talking about the GNU system and giving the credit to the wrong place. But you can then take pleasure anyway because the job has been done. Isn't that the important thing, that the job has been done? Well, it would be very wise advice, except for one thing. The job is not done. The job of maintaining our freedom is never done. People who don't value freedom will find countless opportunities to part with it for some short-term practical advantage. And there are people who seek out opportunities to give you some short-term practical advantage in exchange for your freedom, which you will never get back without a struggle. The job is not done. We have made a great beginning. We have some 20 million odd people using the GNU system, most of whom have unfortunately heard it's Linux that they're using, and most of whom have never heard that the system was created to give them freedom and never heard the suggestion that they should value freedom. And the values of our community are the most important thing to decide our future. Because our values will, decide, will determine our decisions for what we will aim for. Every time we get into a situation which is difficult, where there's a conflict, where there's a, a trouble of some kind, we will have various outcomes to choose from, some of which will be easy and may not preserve our freedom. Will we go to the effort to preserve our freedom? Well, that depends on how much we care about it. The future of our community depends on what we value. And if you look at the situation today in our community in regard to what people value, things don't look good. We're not just beginning to forget about freedom. Most of our community has forgotten. Most of the people in the community have never even heard about it. And most of the people in the community who have heard about it are not telling anybody else about it. Most of the institutions in our community call the system Linux and have endorsed the philosophy of the open source movement and so they don't talk about freedom. <clears throat> and so, if you come into our community, it's rare that you'll ever hear the idea. Where are you going to hear it? Consider, for example, the companies that distribute versions of the GNU slash Linux system, typically calling it something or other Linux. These companies all add non-free software to the distribution. And by doing so, they're, they're showing a set of basic assumptions that it's okay to distribute non-free software and okay to use it. And so they're spreading those values to other people. In fact, at this point, a distribution which is all free software is likely to meet with derision from the users who say, but it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that. Well, get with the program, include these things. They, so much have the users accepted the values of pure practicality and rejected the values of freedom and community. And then consider the magazines about the use of the GNU slash Linux system. Most of them call themselves Linux magazines and call the system Linux. 
and they're mostly filled with ads for non-free software. Every one of those ads carries a message. Non-free software is good for you. It's so good, you might even pay to get a copy. They call these things value-added packages, and that makes a statement about values. It says, value practical expediency, don't value your freedom. Now, I disagree with those values, so I have a different name for those packages. I call them freedom subtracted packages. Because if you have installed a free GNU slash Linux system, and you are now living in a community of freedom, which we have worked for many, many years to create, these packages give you the opportunity to buckle on a chain somewhere. And what about the trade shows of dedicated to the GNU slash Linux system, most of which call themselves Linux shows? And most of them invite companies to sh present non-free software. They're filled with booths displaying and sh advertising non-free software. So they, too, are legitimizing the non-free software. And what about the users groups for users of the GNU slash Linux system? Well, most of them call themselves Linux user groups and invite salesmen to come and present non-free software to the users and to the public, thus putting their stamp of approval on the non-free software. So you look at all these kinds of institutions. Everywhere, the non-free software is being endorsed and encouraged in, in just a few places do you find anyone criticizing it. You find that criticism coming from the GNU project and the free software movement and associated with those names. And so by calling the system GNU slash Linux, you will, with very little work, be able to remind people of where the system actually came from which will make every activity we do more effective because people will take it more seriously when they realize that the system they love exists because of our philosophy. And why do I say that? Can I justify that? Well, yes. Many other people contributed pieces of the system. We developed less than half of it ourselves in the GNU project. But the other developers didn't have the goal of making a complete free system. They developed a program to do this or that for whatever reason, and it turned out to be a useful step forward for our free operating system. But they would never have done the other parts that were missing because that wasn't required by the goal they had in mind. It was required by the goal we were aiming for. We had to make sure every gap got filled because that was needed for our goal. And so we know the others would, per would probably not in a thousand years have made a modern free operating system because they weren't trying to. We were trying to. And why did it have to be a complete free system? Because a non-free program is disrespecting your freedom is obstructing your cooperation with other people, obstructing them from cooperating with you when you want help. And so to live in a cooperating community, you've got to be living in a community of free software exclusively. So In some cases, it doesn't really matter whether people have been persuaded by the free software movement or by the open source movement. In some cases, they'll do the same thing either way. And I must recognize that the open source movement has encouraged many people to develop more free software. This happens when there is no particular obstacle. It's a reasonable sized project and people get excited about doing it, so they sit down and doing it, and do it. 
But when the going gets tough, a movement that tells people that the benefit is convenience is not going to show any rational reason to struggle to overcome adversity. It's irrational to work very hard for your convenience. <laughs> but it is rational to work very hard to keep your freedom. So the free software movement does show people a reason that can rationally motivate people to great efforts against an obstacle, against adversity. Consider what happens, for example, when hardware companies develop new products and won't tell you how to run them. This happens pretty often nowadays. The specs for the hardware are secret. They will, you, they'll sell you the piece of hardware. They won't tell you how you can use it but they will offer you a non-free piece of binary-only software which will enable the GNU slash Linux system to run with that hardware, but not as free software. And then they'll say, well, we support, quote, Linux, unquote. So what are we going to do about this? We can't, in the free, soft in the free world, we can't use that binary-only driver. So what are we going to do? Well, one thing that a few programmers can do is perform reverse engineering and figure out how to run that hardware and then run a, write a free driver. But this is a lot of work. Are people going to be motivated to do this much work? Well, that depends on what they value. If they think the binary-only driver is good enough because it makes the system, quote, run, unquote, then they won't bother. But if they think that the goal is to be used, living in freedom. That gives them a reason to make this great effort. That's a job we only need a few people to do. What are the rest of us going to do? Well, there are 20 million of us now. We can, we can, we can, I have lost the word. We can, create substantial market pressure on a company by not buying the hardware that isn't supported by free software. But will we use the market pressure at our disposal only if we're thinking about the issue and aware of it? So it's very important to spread, again, the concern about using free software. We, will, we could lose this battle simply through inattention Unfortunately, most of the 20 million have never heard about this issue. They're not going to make an effort to encourage companies to support our freedom because they've never even considered the idea. So once again, the future of our community depends on what we value. <clears throat> Another kind of problem happens when free development tools are added to the system. And, and also when free, when, sorry, when non-free, did I say free? Yeah, when non-free development tools and libraries are added to the system. And then other people who are writing free software use those tools and libraries because the result is that they write free software which we can't run. Their programs are free but they won't run in a free operating system because they depend on some tool or library that we can't use. And this has been a recurring problem. What happens is some non-free library gets released and programmers start using it because it's convenient without looking at the question of what the consequences are going to be for people's freedom. And the result <laughs> is that their software, which is free, falls into the trap set by the non-free library. This first happened with Motif. Motif is a, a GUI toolkit, which is, has never been free software, but it was conveniently available to some people. And so they started using it for some free software. Hmm. I contacted some people and said, would you please make your programs work without Motif? And they said, oh, we're not interested. The only solution was to make a free replacement for Motif. That took many years, but a couple of years ago, 
the program less teeth got to be working well enough that most motif applications would run with it. It still needs some finishing up, so please volunteer if your interests run in that direction. You can look, I believe, at leftteeth.org to get in touch with them. So that problem was more or less solved. But in the meantime, another similar problem started up about the QT GUI toolkit, which was, never free, which was not free software but was available gratis. And they permitted its use in free software. And many free software developers didn't recognize the difference between permitting the use of the program in free software and making it free software itself. In fact, a major free software project called KDE to develop desktop packages, the, 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 the easy to use graphical front ends, was based on QT. And the result was that all of KDE was useless in the free world. But the KDE developers didn't recognize this as a problem. So they were constantly recruiting more people to join them. And this threatened a very bad consequence. Because suppose they had made a very good desktop. It would have been tremendously attractive. Most people in the community would have ignored the problem and used it. And we would have had to struggle to solve the problem. It, I decided we had better start solving the problem before things got that bad. So I recruited people for two parallel projects. One was to make a free replacement for QT. The other was to develop an alternative desktop, which is called GNOME. The reason I launched two parallel projects to solve this problem was for redundancy, to increase the chance that we would solve it one way or the other. It was a serious enough threat that it had to be met. Now, it, as it turned out, the, repla the free replacement for QT did not get finished. You know, some parts got written and other parts weren't done yet. So it's not usable. A thing like that is not usable until all of the parts are done. But GNOME took off and lots of people started developing parts of it. In response to our vigorous activities, Eventually, the QT developers changed the license. They made it free software. And then they changed the license again and released it under the GNU GPL. So the problem is now solved. KDE is now available for use in the free world. But I'm sure that this happened as a result of our response to the problem. If, the, if we had accepted the situation as it was, the developers would have seen no need to change. Meanwhile, another such problem has developed with the Java programming language because Java's Sun's Java compiler and Java interpreter and Java libraries are not free software with a small number of exceptions. And Sun is constantly proposing non-free replacements for free popular libraries in Java. And this is going to be the area of a major struggle. One way or another, we need to be able to run Java programs on free software. Sun's libraries are not acceptable. Even their interface definition files are not acceptable because they're not free either and they need to be. And so I ask you, if you ever develop software in Java, pay close attention to the libraries you are using and the interface definition files you are using. Don't use any that are not free. The best way to do this, you can make it sort of automatic, is don't install any of Sun's Java implementation on your machine. Install a free implementation, and then if you try to use a feature that isn't supported, your program immediately won't work. So you'll at least get a diagnostic very soon. You know, if you use Sun's implementation, you may go on for a year not realizing that you're going out on a limb. And then by the time somebody tries to run your program on a free implementation and discovers it doesn't work, 
it may involve redoing a substantial amount of effort and you might not do that and so the problem might not get solved well we can solve these problems with a lot of work but it's much easier to prevent them it's much better if we prevent the problems instead but in order to prevent them we have to be aware of the issue so once again the future of our community depends on what we value we have to tell other people about this issue and urge other people to give it importance enough to base their decisions accordingly the biggest danger though to our progress comes from laws that prohibit the development of certain free software packages laws such as for instance the Digital Millennium Copyright Act laws such as patent law when it's applied to software laws such as UCTA if it prohibits reverse engineering across the board we're seeing efforts to imp impose laws that will make it hard for us to develop free software to do the jobs that users want you know people used to say that it was ridiculous to imagine free software would ever have the capacity to develop the software that users want in this the range of software users want but now we're in the ballpark already now the question is not so much our capacity but whether we will be allowed to do the job consider for example the DMCA Digital Millennium Copyright Act that prohibits at least the court ruled it prohibits the publication of software to read a DVD without getting permission from the owners of that format to release the software and they will not give permission for free software under any circumstances uh, a Norwegian teenager who helped figure out the format helped develop the software was even charged with a crime for having done so uh, what happened is that the movie companies made lots of movies where there was some mad scientist and there was something that quote man was not meant to know unquote and they must have watched those movies too often because now they think that the format of DVDs is something that man is not meant to know and it's the object of a censorship campaign it's being treated as a more dangerous secret than how to make an atomic bomb because how to make an atomic bomb making an atomic bomb could only kill people but reading a DVD they think might endanger the profits of the movie companies and the priorities are clear now software patents are a much bigger danger because they're not limited to accessing certain data formats that are very popular any technique any feature any algorithm could be patented by somebody there in the US over a hundred thousand software patents I believe over 20,000 are being created per year so actually maybe I should up my estimate maybe it's now I'd say over 200,000 and each one of them is a way that somebody could sue you for writing a program that does a certain job now this is dangerous for all software developers it's not just a threat to free software and it wasn't created to be a threat to free software it's created for software developers and others to attack software developers and any business developing software unless it is a multinational corporation is in danger of lawsuits about it it means that every design decision poses the risk of getting you sued but it's a bit worse for free software developers than for the others because we normally don't have any possibility of buying a license and so it's a great threat to us and right now the question of whether to have free, have software patents in Europe has become a political issue that political parties are being forced to take positions on because the public is getting concerned enough in large enough numbers to put it on the agenda 
for several years now, there has been an attempt to officially adopt software patents in Europe. The free software community has taken the lead in, in the resistance. And now, we've actually seen our community stop a proposed governmental action in its tracks. But the, the battle is not over. You know, we have averted immediate total defeat. But we haven't completely won. You know, the decision of, about how, having software patents in Europe is not made in a clear way. Uh, more effort is needed and is being done. But this, if we win in Europe, we're going to have to then go to other countries and push there for changes in law and push against the economic warfare threats of the U.S. government, which is trying to push software patents on all countries. <clears throat> so, uh, we're going to face great obstacles in the future. We've made a start. We've created a community where people can live in freedom. Whether this community will last another 10 years depends on you. And it depends on what you value. It depends on what values you communicate to other people. And this is why I ask you, please call our system GNU slash Linux. Because although it doesn't explicitly say anything about values, it will make people aware of where the system comes from and they'll come across what we say about our values and it may make the difference. And it's also very, very little work for you to do. So, <clears throat> I'd also like to ask you to please see our website and get more information. Our website is www.gnu.org. Also visit the website for the petition against software patents in Europe, which people outside Europe are invited to sign. So you too are invited to sign it. That site is petition.eurolinux.org. As you can see, they are confusing the GNU system with Linux because they're not referring specifically to the kernel there. But nonetheless, the petition is important, so please sign it. And uh, if you're a programmer, please help us by writing free software and by making sure that the, your free software will run in a free environment so that it can be added to a free environment to make a bigger free environment. And uh, you can also help by helping to organize free software development. You could help run our website. There are all sorts of things that you can do if you want to help. And now I will introduce my alter ego and then ask for questions. So you can get a good recording of the rustling of the cloth as it I bless your computer, my child. I am St. Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. Emacs was originally a text editor, but it became a way of life and then a religion for many users. It even has a great schism between two different versions. So it's appropriate that it should have saints. Fortunately, no gods yet. Uh, I can bless your computer by exorcising the evil proprietary operating system from it. Uh, the Church of Emacs has some advantages by comparison with other churches. For one thing, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. <laughs> so if you're looking for a, ch a church to be holy in, you might want to consider ours. But sainthood does require making a moral commitment to live a life of purity. And you have to vow to exercise the evil proprietary system 
from your, all your computers and then install a wholly free operating system and then only install free software on top of that. If you make this commitment and live by it, you too will be a saint and you too may eventually have a halo. <laughs> now, sometimes people ask me, is it a sin in the Church of Emacs to use VI? The answer is that using a free version of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> People also sometimes ask me if my Halo is really an old computer disk. This is not a computer disk, this is my Halo. <laughs> However, it was a computer disk in a former existence. I do not know what kind of computer it came from or what data was stored on it, but I can assure you that no non-free software is accessible from it now. <laughs> so, that's my speech. Now I'll ask for questions. <laughs> the idea of building uh, a free program on top of an operating system or platform which is not free or using a compiler which is not free um, is clearly at least in the spirit of, 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 of the free software movement in the right track but clearly not acceptable from the tenets well, that you... Well, right track compared with which alternative, you see. Whether, for these intermediate things, whether it's good or bad depends depends on what alternative you're comparing it with. You know, making that program free is better than making it non-free. Mm. Running a free program on a non-free system is better than ru running a non-free application on the system. It might conceivably get people used to the idea of using free software. Maybe eventually they'll switch to a free system as well. But it's not guaranteed and it's not as good as living in freedom and using all free software. So you might say, well, it's, it's a good first step. Well, that might be true if it's a first step. Is there going to be another step? You know, will the people later take the step to freedom or not? You can't be sure, they w you can't assume they will. Now, if we do enough to spread the idea, the values of freedom, that makes it more likely that they will take the next step, that it will be a first step and therefore could be good. If we don't spread those values, they're less likely to take a second step and then it isn't a first step and it isn't particularly good. Now, a lot of people justify what they're doing by saying, well, they're introducing more people to free software. And certainly, it's useful to introduce more people to free software, but then you've got to follow up by teaching them the civics of our community, what free software is all about and why, so that they will then start valuing freedom. What we have today is a situation where lots of people are trying their damnedest to introduce more people to free software, to some free software, and very few are trying to do the second step of teaching them to value freedom. The result is we've got a gigantic pile of people who use some free software and have never heard about the idea of freedom. So it's out of balance. We need more people talking about freedom, even if that means somewhat fewer introducing new users. Uh, clearly you have this, you have the, this uh, goal of, of introducing people to the idea of freedom. Have you thought of incorporating this directly into the software which uh, which you write, such as either you know making a message pop up every once in a while, or or um, incorporating it in your uh, in your in some public license of some sort? Uh, the preamble of the GNU General Public License already talks about this, and uh, some of our programs come with other information about the philosophy. So we're, yes, we're doing that. Although maybe there are ways we could do more of it if, you know, if someone thinks of specific instances, we might be able to do more of it. Oh. Just a second. The, uh, you mentioned that you used Unix as a model to create the, the GNU operating system. Um, 
in order for people to be able to port their the, the programs that they already had for that operating system, do you then think that uh, efforts like Wine and other efforts that will try to make Windows programs compatible with uh, the GNU operating system uh, are similarly important today? I think emulation of other popular systems is a very useful thing to do, and I encourage people to work on these emulators. And in fact, there, it's very important for a specific reason. A few years ago, I was dismayed to see people crying in triumph when popular proprietary programs were released to inversions to run on GNU slash Linux. And uh, the idea of, of calling it a, a step forward for our community that a proprietary program is available misses the point completely. But, of course, their reason was, they thought, well, this means the users who want to use that application will now be able to run it on GNU slash Linux. Uh, and indeed, it is a step forward. You know, running that proprietary application on GNU slash Linux is a step forward from running it on a proprietary operating system. But we must not be crowing about the availability of some proprietary program. Now, if, they could, if people could run the Windows versions using Windows emulators, then there would be no reason for people to care that much if a native GNU slash Linux version got released. So it would, it would enable us to provide people with ways to run those programs if they're determined to without our telling people about those programs or that there are special versions for our system which puts us in the position of effectively endorsing those programs. Um, well, that leads to an, an interesting uh, idea that's come up in the news, at least to my attention, in the last few weeks, which is uh, new consortiums uh, of software and hardware and intellectual property makers in general um, getting together to uh, put hardware-level enforcement of let's just say another economic system of software besides your own, um, into hardware. Effectively, the first step, I guess, is hard drives that will not function under operating systems that do not have some design and license management system. Uh, well, actually, first of all, those drives will work with kernels like Linux. It's just that they won't use these features. However, uh, I think those systems are disgusting. I should point out that they all rely ultimately on having laws prohibiting people from telling each other the knowledge necessary to bypass those systems. They're all based on, on censorship. And I think that it's desirable at this point to organize politically against those systems. However, I think that's just a part of the problem I've already mentioned. And I don't think that those systems themselves are going to be quite as fatal as, as the other problems I've already mentioned. Um, do you now or did you then consider any of the versions of Unix that came out, say, between the late 70s and 1991 as free versions of Unix, like Berkeley or Bell Labs? Uh, Unix was not free software. There was a time when universities could get a source license for a very low fee, but they st it was still a non-disclosure agreement. Now, in around 1985 or 86, I went to the people, well, that's, I'm sorry, that's starting in the middle. Let me start at the beginning. In the early 80s, people at Berkeley started developing improvements in Unix. And many people started using the somewhat improved Berkeley version of Unix, which included some features inspired by the incompatible time-sharing system, by the way. Uh, but the, this was only available to those who had AT&T licenses and could show them to Berkeley. In effect, Berkeley was donating its work to AT&T. In 85 or 86, thus after the GNU project was going, 
I visited those people and pointed out to them that AT&T was not a charity and was not worthy of their donation. And I asked them to please start separating all of their code from the Unix code so that their code could be released as free software. At some point after that, they started doing so and released uh, a useful collection of network software and some other software. And then they started aiming towards replacing all that remained of the AT&T Unix software. And eventually they released something called Berkeley System Distribution. Uh, the successor of AT&T tried suing them to stop its release for a while, but their suit was, not, was actually frivolous and they dropped it after a year or so. And so in around 1984, uh, an almost complete version of BSD system became available. And then other people started completing it and making their own divergent versions. There are now some three different free outgrowths of the BSD system, as well as a non-free one. So all those BSD versions, were none of them were free? Well, the... Un the BSD 4.4 Lite <coughs> was the first one that was free, but it was not a complete system. There were a few little pieces that were missing. Of course, it didn't take some people long to write those, and then they did make some free versions of BSD. I was just wondering, because of the confusion over free, have you put any thought towards, and I know it's late in the game, but uh, an alternative name? I've thought a lot about possible alternatives to the term free software. My conclusion is that there is no term in English that is really better. Every term has flaws. In particular, the term open source is also very widely misunderstood. Most people, if you ask them what open source software means, will give you the wrong answer. That is, assuming they've heard of it at all. They'll give you the wrong answer. They'll give you the answer that those words naturally suggest as English, which is simply that the source is on display and you can look at it, which is one of the preconditions, of course, for free software, but it's much, much less. Now, if you look at what the open source movement actually says, their definition is a lot closer to the requirements of free software, which means that their phrase also is being given a meaning that is not the natural meaning and that people don't understand unless they've been given a careful explanation. People who haven't seen or don't remember that careful explanation almost invariably misunderstand greatly what it means. And that's true of every possible phrase. I mean, some people like to borrow the French word libre because in French, there are, two, there are two words, libre and gratuit, and they, you know, one refers to freedom and the other refers to price, and they're unambiguous. Well, that works somewhat, but uh, it looks a bit unnatural to use a French word in the middle of English. You know, but there are various alternatives. All of them have enough of a flaw that it wouldn't be good to switch to them now. Are there plans underway to replace the proprietary libraries of languages such as Java with um, totally free versions? Yes. Uh, people are working on this. There are some legal issues because, uh, you know, you have to replace the interface definition files too. And, of course, there are certain parts of the interface definition files that can't actually be done differently. You know, because if you change those at all, those parts, then the thing would be incompatible. So uh, then there's, our, our legal advice is that you are allowed to say, look at a manual and based on that, write a file, which is an interface definition. If you don't read the Sun official interface definition file. So we're going to be looking for people to do this. <laughs> Uh, in, in light of, of the argument you've made that, that naming is such an important aspect of software or, or of an operating system, um, have you considered 
adding a clause to one of your uh, agreements stating that the name of the software has to have like a G at the beginning or uh, GNU at the beginning or any, any no. some other combination. Well, I might as well answer. Uh, basically, no, we're not going to do this. For one thing, uh, the individual programs, we don't have a real problem of not getting credited for them. The question is the name, of, not of the individual trees, but of the forest. What happens is the people who think the forest is Linux, they recognize that the GNU project planted some of the trees. They underestimate which ones. You, you'll often hear people say that the GNU project developed some tools. Well, some of them are tools. Some of them it's sort of a strain to call them tools. But it, nobody's pointing at individual programs and denying us the credit for them or denying whoever, you know, whoever the authors were the credit for them. It's the realization that we were, we had decided to make a forest and it's there because of that, that we don't have. Uh, I don't think you could legally require people to call the whole system by any one particular name or one kind of name. And also, I've made a decision not to make this a legal issue. It's a moral issue. It's in, I'm hoping people will recognize the moral obligation to give us credit but I am not going to try to force anyone. Blue and red. Um, I'm just a little bit confused by the, your freedom number two, the uh, freedom to distribute. Would it be a, why would it be a violation if it's okay to distribute as long as you always go back to the source? In other words, as I see it, the problem is sometimes friends are distributing things and then because of that, you lose sight of where it came from or the history and then you run into problems with the Linux and so I'm just wondering if everyone came back to the source, why what would that What do you mean by that? Back to the source. What do you mean by source? In other words, the original author that they can't the Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well that's like saying, wouldn't it be bad to eat as long as you were fasting? I mean if if they can only get it from the original developer then you can't redistribute it, which means you can't have, to, which means you can't help your friend when your friend asks you for help. You point him in the right direction. That may be very painful. I'm sorry, and the original author may disappear, or may be uncooperative, or it may be too expensive, or you know, basically, you should have the right to help your neighbor. You know, you you can either agree with or disagree with my arguments about the importance of the right to help, freedom to help your neighbor. But the fact is, telling somebody, well, I won't give it to you, but you can go talk to him and see if he'll give it to you, is saying no to your neighbor. It's not helping your neighbor. Um, I think that your argument about the importance of freedom in software comes across fairly clearly to people who are in the software field or even people who are interested in software to a certain degree, but what about, you said that there are 20 million people using uh, GNU Linux or some variant thereof. I can't imagine that all of those 20 million are interested in seeing what's going on under the hood. How would you tell them to, su to some guy who's like, you know, I, I just use I it, I don't care. Today. I've already given you several reasons why non-programmers, why these freedoms are, can be useful to people who are not programmers. So. Uh, maybe you can look at one of the tapes. Uh, there, I mean, one would think from your question that I hadn't mentioned that. Well, what most of the arguments that you gave today make sense for someone to have most of their software be free software, but you know, for someone who doesn't care about modifying it, no, any. you're wrong. The argument about the freedom. To, first of all, the argument about the freedom to help your neighbor, you know, copying is something any computer user can do, so you don't have to be a programmer. And secondly, the benefits of the software's being free are important even if you personally don't take advantage of the freedom to change it. And the other thing is if you're a business, the fact that, that you can change it if you need to is important you know, to, to be able to know that you can is important 
independent of which programs turn out to have the bugs that you need to fix. You don't know which programs are going to turn out to have those problems. The important thing is to take the precaution of making sure you can fix problems when they occur. If you're lucky, you'll never encounter an important bug. But we're not always lucky. Well, he has a, yeah. Well, there are two more being asked now. So. Uh, just in response to, I've been thinking about what you said earlier, I feel that I, I agree with the helping the neighbor bit, but I feel that sometimes it can come at a cost of hurting the author if they spent their entire life building something. But Don't exaggerate. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody has ever spent his entire life developing a program. That's an exaggeration. I, mean, that For, I know. I, you're, you're exaggerating to make a false point, to make a false scenario, to exaggerate the reason on the other side, and that's not right. Uh, but in any case, uh, I reject the term hurt because it is not hurting the author. Now, maybe the author hoped by dividing other people and keeping them helpless to get some money. And maybe the author is getting less money than he expected. I don't believe that is wrong because I think that the author's activities in that case are wrong. It's wrong to divide people and keep them deliberately helpless. And I don't believe that that deserves a reward. So I think it's good if people are not buying that program and not rewarding that antisocial behavior. A non-free program can be useful in a practical sense. It can enable people to get some jobs done but only for people who are willing to give up their freedom. So it's a temptation to give up your freedom, to participate in a system where nobody has freedom. I think that's bad. I would like to see that stop. I don't want to see those programs developed at all. Now, there's a general social principle that it's good to reward people who contribute to society and punish people who harm society. Developing free software contributes to society, and I think it's good to find more ways of rewarding those developers. Developing proprietary software harms society, and we should be looking for more ways to punish those developers, or at least not let, it, let them benefit from what they're doing. So if they didn't benefit, they would, they would stop. I, I think that mere malice would not motivate very many people to develop proprietary software. <laughs> Um, in your, towards the beginning, when you made the definition of, of what was general um, technical knowledge and therefore you couldn't agree to, to confidentiality over as opposed to um, his, his love life, uh, which you could, um, to put it in context, how do, where do you stand on traditional book publishing, you know, the idea that someone could make money and enforce... Well, that's, you just changed the subject completely, have I? Um, yes. <laughs> Well, because traditional books that are published are not secret. There's no non-disclosure agreement there at all. Right, so maybe that's the wrong way to phrase the question. The question, the question is where do you stand on enforcing copyright on traditional book publishing? In the age of the printing press, when copying was only feasible if it was mass production, I think copyright was a reasonable system. It didn't restrict the reader. It only restricted publishers and authors the things that a reader could feasibly do were legal for readers to do. So because of that, it didn't impose a great cost on society. The problems that exist now didn't result in that context. But we're not in the age of the printing press anymore. Copyright is changing from an industrial regulation restricting publishers and authors into a system of subjugation of the readers, domination, by business of the public. And the interesting thing is that the, this change in effect can happen even if the words of the law are unchanged because they are applied in a context. The context is different, so the consequences are different. Plans in connection with ebooks to block all of these things, to take away these few vestigial freedoms not just to stop you from copying them, which on a computer you ought to be able to do. The experience of Napster shows us how tremendously useful it is 
for everybody to be able to uh, redistribute copies of music. And clearly that applies to books as well. And so it must be permitted. However, for some kinds of works, it might be okay to have a copyright system that restricts commercial distribution and that uh, for some kinds of works it might be reasonable to limit it to verbatim copying only. Now for functional works like programs and manuals and textbooks and recipes and dictionaries and encyclopedias, the freedom to make modified versions is essential. But for works that serve other kinds of purposes that are not functional, that are not used to get a job done primarily, uh, that argument doesn't apply. So for other kinds of works, verbatim copying only might be acceptable. Now I have an idea for how musicians and some kinds of writers could make a living in the future. It assumes a situation where, say, five times as many people are on the internet as now, and it assumes that we have some simple, very efficient internet payment system so that if you want to pay somebody 50 cents, you can do that efficiently. Then imagine everybody is free to redistribute music, but whenever you play a piece, while it's playing and afterwards, there's a box on the screen. And, you can, and the box says, click here to send a dollar to the band. And you can click there if you want at any time or not. I think a lot of people would click there to send money to the bands they like. Now you can't do this now. Uh, there is, there's, a, there's a system designed for payments on the internet called PayPal, but it, the price of it is around 50 cents per transaction, the overhead. So for a small transaction like a dollar, it's not reasonable. For five dollars, it's reasonable. But asking people to click here to donate five dollars, it might discourage people a lot. If it's a dollar or fifty cents, it feels like nothing. And think about if you think about it, you'll discover that that's all they're going to get if you buy their record anyway. The, <laughs> the music industry distributes an average of four percent of its income to musicians. And you can be sure that that is skewed, that very successful musicians are getting more than 4% of the sales figure of their records, and that the other musicians are getting less than 4% of the sales figure of their records, which means probably less than 50 cents per record. And yet it is in the name of these musicians that the multinational music factories demand increased power to control what you do. <coughs> Any more questions? Um, okay, so you explained how having non-free software contributes to material harm um, to society and to people in general. Now then, let's say, um, now a company like Microsoft, the way, they, their, their, their software is non-free and they make it non-free so they can bring in money. Yes. And then they in turn use that money to hire programmers, they to hire software. They use part of that money. Oh, they use part of that money to, anyways, they have a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and they can use that money to hire a lot of programmers. You said you What's have, point? I'm getting to it, <laughs> gradually. And you, you said you have, faster? And you said you have about 20,000 programmers, yeah. part-time volunteers. No, uh, well, it's more than 20,000, but yes, they're part-time. Part-time volunteers. Microsoft, I don't know how many programmers I they have on either. staff, but I'm sure it's a lot. Okay, what's and so the relevance what, of the comparison? Though? I'm just saying, what they can do, because of those resources, they can make software in time frames and of certain like popularity and quality. Okay, is that a, yes, I see your argument. that they can develop maybe more software. We can develop it perhaps more efficiently, but maybe they, at present, they can develop more. Now, what conclusions can we draw from that? 
if you agree with my philosophy, that is re a regrettable problem that they can develop so much software. Because each piece of proprietary software is a temptation. You see, you have neighbors, and to live in a society, you depend on your neighbors to help you. But they might sign a license with Microsoft promising not to share with you. So that that, that software is all a temptation to divide between you and other people and divide between uh, divide other people for me as well. That's why I'm unhappy that Microsoft can develop so much software. I wish they couldn't develop so much, and I hope it, as we develop increasing amounts of free software, I'm hoping that eventually Microsoft will find itself unable to develop so much and uh, that they'll lose that ability to tempt people into betraying their neighbors. You see, if you look at it, if you assume that the goal is simply to develop software, regardless of how you're allowed to use it and in what social arrangements you're allowed to use it, if you ignore that, then it can look like the proprietary software social system is very effective. So it depend, It all starts from your choice of values. When you look at it that way, you're making a choice of purely practical values. Now, the open source movement is arguing that even based on those purely practical values, you, you get better software from our way of doing things. But I am saying that those values are only part of the important things in life, and that what kind of way of life you could have is also important, and that the Microsoft way is clearly totally bad as regards those values. So that's why I don't care, you know, regardless of the speculation about how much and how good software those companies will be able to develop, we can certainly look and see what, is, what they have developed. And in 1984, Unix was available, and Unix was pretty good, and it was proprietary. And I said, that's not acceptable for me in my life. I'm not going to settle for using Unix. I want to use a free system instead. So I looked at the software that they had developed in that way, and I said, I, I don't want to live that way. So you're not necessarily disagreeing. You're not necessarily saying that like um, free software is better software, or that um, maybe large corporations can make can do things that um, a community can't do. You're just saying philosophically, it's better to have free software. I'm saying more or less yes. Free software permits a better way of life. Now there are some reasons why free software often tends to be better. I won't claim that they are guaranteed. I mean, freedom tends to, in many ways, lead to practical advantages. But it's not the case that you can never find anybody who will give you some practical convenience if you give up your freedom, especially if somebody has basically obtained investors to, to create something to offer you so that he can give you that kind of choice. And that is what many business plans consist of. Somebody has carefully thought, how can we do a lot of work so that we can offer people the chance to get some practical convenience by giving up some freedom? And you know they have to do they have to do work to to create that kind of situation. It doesn't just happen. But after all, they're a business. They get investment. They can do work to create such a situation. And so, if we don't want to be giving into that kind of problem, we have to recognize them and adopt the policy of saying no. Any more questions, or should we? Dec it's been long. So I think we should declare it over. Are, there are some GNU materials here, right? Where are they? Oh, back there. Uh, <laughs> let's see what you've got. Take them out. Don't leave them in a box. Let's see, we have GNU man. Oh, take out the, ma the manuals. We have manuals for sale. We have T-shirts for sale. And do we have stickers? There might be some stickers in there. Tom, do you know if we brought any stickers? Oh, well, there's some stickers in room 427.